Hello and welcome. I'm Pearson Cross. I'm the Associate Dean of the College of Liberal, Liberal Arts. And this is one of the, the events that we have to celebrate and commemorate Constitution Day here at UL Lafayette. We are required to do so by the United States government, which has passed the law requiring that institutions like ours that collect money from the federal government, in fact, do something to recognize Constitution Day that provides the structure and the guiding course for our entire experiment in self-government. And so as part of that, we had a few events today. We had a naturalization ceremony a little earlier in the library. We read the Constitution and we heard some speeches. So tonight we are going to do something focusing like we typically do, although it's different every year when we celebrate it, on a constitutional issue. And the uh, issue this year is going to be roughly in the area of immigration, because a lot of people were talking about that. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our philosophy professor, Jesse Saloum. And uh, also, I'd like to uh, do a, give a shout out to the philosophy club and its leader over there, Dr. Andre, Andre Kahn. Thank you. Thank you. And without further ado. Yeah, welcome, everyone. As Dr. Cross said, on behalf of Circles of Feel, welcome. Um, to this event, <laughs> Immigration, Asylum, and Separation of Families, a campus conversation. Uh, before we get started, I'm just going to introduce our panelists today. First, we have Dr. Paul Zena. She's a uh, professor um, in the Lafayette General Medical Center and Our Lady of Lords, Endowed Chair of Nursing in the College of Nursing, and Director of Research at the Picard Center for Child Development. Throughout her career as a pediatric nurse and psychologist, educator, and researcher. Her work is centered at the interface of health and mental health for children and families. She is a chair of the, Laf of the Louisiana Adverse Childhood Experiences Initiative and is involved in local, state, and national efforts focusing on adversity in childhood. So we're very lucky to have her. Uh, Dr. Richard E. Frankel is an associate professor of modern German history at UL with interest in nationalism, anti-Semitism, and political culture. He's written numerous op-eds op on the United States, including issues in, of immigration and exclusion. That they've appeared at the History News Network and other online outlet, outlets. He is currently at work on a new book link project that explores the relationship between anti Semitism and globalization from in the late 19th and early 20th century with a focus on Germany and the United States. Uh, we're also very lucky to have Dr. Elise Franklin. Her research uh, includes the history of France and its empire, modern Europe, gender, race, and of note, migration. Uh, she's currently working on a book which unravels the slow process of decolonization from Algeria between 1954 and 1981. Um, and finally, uh, we're very lucky to have Anna Maria Grand. She's an associate at, uh, and I can't really say this, Pecorero uh, uh, Law in Lafayette, Louisiana, where she practices immigration law. Anna represents employers and individuals through the complex immigration process and has represented clients processing through U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, an executive office for immigration review. Anna is a graduate of the Paul M. Aver Law Center at LSU, where she served as a student attorney in the immigration clinic, successfully representing special immigration juveniles seeking law, lawful permanent residents in the U.S. She's a first generation U.S. citizen and understands the challenges faced by families and individuals assimilating to life in the U.S. And she uses this experience to inform her immigration work. I would love to have such a lengthy description one day of me, the very accomplished uh, panelists. Um, just as a, as a quick opener, right, as to what, what we're talking about, uh, in April of this year, the Trump, or the Trump administration began a zero tolerance policy to prosecute as many illegal boarding crossings as possible. Uh, this including detaining parents <coughs> separately from their children while they undergo criminal proceedings. Uh, the administration official said that, said that over 2,300 children were separated from 2,200 parents at the U.S.-Mexico border in just six weeks between May 5th and June 9th. Hundreds of these children have yet to be reunited with their families, and the government is separating around 65 children a day from their families. And the military has agreed to provide additional space to detain 20,000 immigrants for extended periods. So no real end in sight, I guess. Uh, I was hoping to start sure. with uh, Dr. Zena. So as a pediatric nurse and psychologist, what effect do you see this having on these children? Uh, thank you for that, that introduction because, uh, you know, this topic has become a hot topic in the last few months, right? I mean, it was just all over the place. 
although although children at the border has has been an issue for a long long time but there was something that was different about at this time and that was that as you were saying the the decision to have zero tolerance to criminally prosecute parents meant that if parents are going to jail then children have to be separated right. and so um, this was seen as, you know, this, the rationalization for this was to be tough on immigration, of course. You know, you pay your nickel, take your chances. You, you know, if you're going to bring your children to the U.S. illegally, then this is the, this is the price you pay. There were even religious uh, rationales for it, um, saying that, you know, to obey the laws of the government is what you're supposed to do and that sort of thing. Um, so. Obviously, it, it created quite a bit. I had some slides, but I'm going to kind of go through my slides real, real quick and talk to you. This stuff got the ire of pretty much every professional organization that has anything to do with children and families. Colleen Kraft, who's, a, who's the head of the American Academy of Pediatrics, went to the border and was in one of the detention facilities, and she described this two-year-old in tears saying she was just crying and pounding and having a huge, huge temper tantrum. This child was just screaming and nobody could help her. And we know why she was crying. She didn't have her mother. She didn't have a parent who could soothe her and take care of her. She added that um, the facility people had been told not to pick her up, not to pick up children, not to comfort them, not to, not to hold them or, or anything. These often <coughs> Uh, obviously, they're, they're, they're sudden and they're often violent separations. There were stories of women, of babies literally being pulled away from their caregivers, women breastfeeding and babies taken away. I mean, you know, pretty, pretty horrible things happening on top of an experience of abuse often or exposure to violence or extreme um, adversity before they either before, before they left and on their way to the U.S. So oftentimes children have seen people murdered. There may be threats to their families. There may be wide, I mean, when, we, when you look at the data and you look and see uh, the amount of abuse that goes on, the, the, the violence, the home, the domestic violence and so forth that goes on along in these families before they even get to our country, we're piling this experience of separation on top of experience that they've already been having. So pretty vulnerable. As I mentioned, you know, hundreds and hundreds of professional organi organizations protested this. In one, one letter to uh, the Home Department of Homeland Security, 500 professional organizations, national organizations, state organizations wrote and protested. In another letter, 2,000 college professors and uh, college and university professors wrote in protest to Homeland Security. It got everybody, uh, it got everybody, everybody upset. And it was called things like, you know, these, this was across child welfare, pediatrics, juvenile justice, child health, development, safety, law, child protection, the whole, the whole thing. And, and some people <coughs> called, the, the faculty members in their protest letter called this an extreme human rights breach. Um, faith leaders, I mean, even though faith was used as an excuse for this, Pretty much every single major religious organization came out against this. Catholics, Episcopalians, Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists, Sikhs, Jews, Muslims, everybody came out against that. Um, and of course there were lots of other people too, even Melania Trump <laughs> came out and she was saying this is, we should be, we should have a, a fam, we should have be, we need to be a country that follows the law but also governs with the heart. People were heartbroken at watching these children being separated. Um, so obviously it generated protests and rallies and, and stuff around the world. The UN, uh, university, the UN rights um, was calling it government sanctioned child abuse. Um, cruel, immoral, a violation of children's rights in international law. Um, many, many organizations, you know, wrote statements. For example, this is the American Psychological Association, but this is an example that, that, what they, that they said. Um, the administration's policy of separating children from their families as they attempt to cross into the U.S. without documentation is not only needless and cruel, it threatens the mental and physical health of both the children and their caregivers. 
Psychological research, research shows that immigrants experience unique stressors related to conditions that led them to flee their, from their home countries in the first place. The longer that children and parents are separated, the greater the reported symptoms of anxiety and depression for the children. So I want to, what I want to do now is, is just uh, say, give the, I mean, there's moral, there's moral cases against this, there's legal, I believe there's legal arguments against this, social, cultural reasons to oppose separation of children from families, but I'm going to give you the short version of the scientific reason. I think that's what makes everybody crazy about this. So first I want to say that more than 70 years of research has focused on early childhood development and this early research came out of looking at how children were World War II, during World War II when children were naturally separated by their parents if you will because of Y'all know more than about this than I do, but you know, in England there was bombings, children, you know, parents were killed, all that sort of stuff. They put kids in orphanages, they put children in orphanages. And astute uh, social workers and psychiatrists and, and nurses and others noticed how these children acted and what happened to them in the course of this separation. They would see these children, of course, at first they would cry and they would be in distress and they would protest and that sort of stuff. But then they would begin to withdraw, and they would begin to have less communication with the world, to the point that some of them would literally curl up in a ball and not even be able to communicate with other people. This, this research was so powerful, it actually changed how we cared for children in hospitals. So when I was a little girl, not far after that, there weren't parent visiting hours. I mean, there were, parents didn't come into the hospital, parents came for visiting hours. Now, if you dare take a child to the hospital, you better stay there if you're the parent, because we know children need their parents in times of distress. This was extremely powerful research that, that changed, you know, it got to the UN, the World Health Organization, and so forth. And that began a cascade of research that's probably the most powerful research we have right now in child development. And if you fast forward, anyway, let me back up for a second. So what came out of that, those early, that early research, and I'm really uh, simplifying it in a way, was that children, young children, babies, very young babies, are biologically predisposed to need and lean on their caregivers. If you think about it, an infant can't survive by themselves. They have to have somebody to take care of them. And so what we look at, what has been looked at over the years is what happens in that caregiving context when the, ch when the child is, to how is the child taken care of by the parent? There's just, you know, we could fill up probably two of these un student unions with the research that's gone on on all of this. It's really pretty compelling. The child is dependent on the caregiver for survival. In fact, those, those babies in the, in, the, in the English nurseries, they were getting good physical care. They were dry, they were warm, they were fed, they were clean, good nursing care, you know, but they weren't being nurtured. They weren't being held. They weren't being stimulated. Those children died, not, not did they just withdraw, but they tended to die at much higher rates as well. So we know that the parental role is extremely important for not just physical safety, but for emotional safety. So when you think about, about when children are in distress, who do they go to for help? This is, this is kind of the, the crux of this whole issue. Um, we have to learn from the very beginning, who do I turn to when I need help, when I'm in distress, when I'm in pain, when I'm sad, when I'm lonely, how do I get the help I need when I don't have words? And I don't have I don't have other ways to do that. So parents are the providers of that. I'm saying parents loosely, and they're really the conduit about how children understand the rest of the world. So little babies don't know if they're rich or poor, black or white, you know, whatever. They just know it's me and my caregiver. That's how they learn about the world. And so how this is important because whatever the parent is experiencing impacts how they take care of the child, right? So that's what we know is that children who learn early on that I can count on my caregiver to be there when I need them, who loves me, who cares for me, who values me, those kids 
forever do better. They do better cognitively, they do better socially, they have better health outcomes, they have a whole host of better outcomes in general. More recently, there's been interest in what's called uh, toxic stress. Um, some of this comes out of looking at children in R uh, Romanian nurseries, for example. Um, in fact, my husband, you know, in all fairness, my husband did a lot of the work on this. And it's been extremely powerful because now we're in the age where we can look at brain development. We can look at the physiological underlying, because it's not just, oh, this poor child, the mushy-wushy, you know, kind of, but it's like, what's actually happening to the child physiologically? And what we find is that something called toxic stress, which is severe, frequent, prolonged adversity, and I would say separation from parents during, you know, in this cases of these immigrant children, would count of that, affects the developing brain. It affects brain connections. So when that brain is developing very, very rapidly in those first few years of life, those connections don't happen the same as if they're in a safe, nurturing environment. It affects the stress response system, that fight or flight physiology that gets us to get tense, raise our blood pressure, raise our heart rate, all those things that prepare us to fight adversity. When that, when that is on for a long time, it has physiological long-term consequences, which I'll say in a minute. There are effects on the genetics, on genetics. So we have a basic blueprint for genes, but the details are based on experience, and actually experience, great research now, showing that experience impacts genetics, our own genetics. So these kinds of findings are extraordinarily um, compelling, and what, we, what, is, what is being found now is that we can get through adversity, adults and children, oftentimes, if we have support. So if I'm, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use a Katrina experience, because I was in <coughs> New Orleans during Katrina. You know, it was a horrible thing. But if I'm with somebody who says, you know, we're gonna get through this, this is hard, we lost everything, but we're gonna get through this, I'm gonna be much more able to get through it than if I'm all by myself and have nobody to turn to. Most recently, uh, so we, what we see in children in these types of, of, of adversity, we'll see anxiety, fear, depression, withdrawal, anger, aggression, unusual behaviors like regret, like they'll regress, they might start hurting themselves, um, trying to hurt, I mean, they, they may have poor sleep, poor appetite, poor growth, self-harm, even suicidal behaviors, post-traumatic stress disorder. We've seen some examples of children who don't recognize their caregiver when they do get re reunited because they, you know, they've sort of, the, the stress of that. So that's bad enough. I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking to see a child who's in distress and, and when we know physiologically what's going on, but perhaps another way to look at it is, is from the adverse childhood experiences studies that are out there as well. Another set of, another set of data that has been creating the, the outrage of the separation, and that is that um, some good longitudinal research now is showing that early adversity in children during childhood is associated with all kinds of health outcomes in adulthood. So heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, you pretty much name it. The more adversity one has in childhood, the more likely one is to have significant health problems as they get older. So we're not talking about just here and now, we're talking about long-term health outcomes. So I'm gonna more or less stop that. If people call it, the, you know, so, so basically we know that science tells us this is not a good thing. Right. Biologically it's not good, emotionally it's not good. Um, there are risks not only for immediate problems, but for the long-term long -term health risk too. So I'm gonna stop at that right. point, is that okay? Yeah. Is that no, too much? I did go no, too much. No. Yeah, so it's not on. just uh, <laughs> that it's cruel in the short run, it's that we have long-term Yeah, I mean, and it really isn't about, I mean, I know that some people will say, oh, you're just, you know, it's just the soft-hearted people right. about this. But really there's, there's tons of excellent science that's now showing the biology of this, which I think is extremely compelling if you don't, if you're not moved by a crying child. <laughs> yeah, right. right. By the way, we'll have time for questions afterwards. No new questions if you have for uh, later. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Um, Dr. Frankel, as our, one of our two historians here, uh, do you see any parallels historically, or do you see any? Um, well, uh, as I could talk about a few things. Um, not as much specifically about child separation. Um, if you look at uh, 
Nazi Germany, which I've been writing about um, in terms of comparisons with other policies. Um, the Nazis, for the most part, didn't separate families. It wasn't an issue of, of obviously Jews coming into Germany anymore at that point. Um, it was a question of Jews leaving. Uh, there is an interesting case of, of child separation. You mentioned England uh, during the war. Um, in 1938, right after Kristallnacht, which was a nationwide pogrom against Jews, um, there was a, uh, a small group that tried to um, arrange for uh, children of uh, Jewish families in Germany and, and in Austria to... Um, to be allowed to, to leave, uh, to go to England. Um, and um, it was worked out. It was uh, numbered in the, it was not a tremendous number, a number I think in the thousands. Um, but um, that was of course, uh, in a sense, a situation forced upon them by, by Nazi policy. By, um, by that point, November of 1938, it was clear to just about everybody the Jews had no uh, future in Germany. Um, but of course, still the idea of having to, as a parent, um, having to decide whether or not to send off your child, um, and you don't know what your fate will be, you don't know if you'll ever see them again. Uh, so it was a very heartrending um, situation that they were placed in. Uh, those that, that made that decision, um, in most cases, the vast majority of those parents did not survive the war. Uh, the children just about all did uh, because they were in England at that point. Uh, and the few that, that did, did survive, or I should say, did, were, were able to be reunited with their parents, um, as you mentioned, the ability to recognize, um, not that they couldn't recognize, but um, you know, some of them who went away when they were you know, nine or ten years old, uh, didn't see their parents again until they were 17, um, and they were very different, you know, um, as a young child as opposed to a teenager, and, you know, the ability to bond after that, the ability to, um, certainly you can't recapture those years, but um, that something was, something was lost. They were really, in a sense, different people and so that's uh, that was a reality uh, for children who were separated um, I think and in, and you know when Jewish families uh, when Jews were deported from Germany once they uh, the final solution was underway um, again they didn't separate children upon deportation the families were sent to the east together um, if they were sent to Auschwitz, for example, the family separation took place at the very beginning when uh, overwhelmingly uh, women and children would be separated from the, from the fathers and the husbands and sent immediately to the gas chambers. Um, so uh, some women, some strong children were allowed to survive and work until they died, but that would be uh, an example of, of family separation there at the, at the very end. But I think there's also something to be said about family separation. Um, you said, you know, as a warning, right? Don't, you know, this is the price you're going to pay if you come. I think there's also another message, not just for those who are thinking about coming, um, but also for uh, those Hispanic um, people who are in this country already, whether they're whether they're not citizens, whether they are not citizens yet, or whether they are citizens for that matter, um, it sends a message that they are unwelcome, um, that they are not seen as, um, you could argue, as fully human. You know, you don't put human beings in cages. Uh, and putting children in camps and putting them in cages, treating them, taking away from their, uh, from their parents, uh, as if it were a normal process of you know, um, law enforcement, you know, there is no um, practical necessity to do that. The only purpose it has is to torment uh, and to torture. Um, and you, you do that to people who you think less of. Um, and I think uh, in that regard, there's a parallel with, with Nazi Germany, and that is um, separating out certain groups of people, um, 
Donald Trump, Stephen Miller, and others uh, around him, like-minded people like that, uh, have an understanding of, of America. They have a, an image of what an American is, uh, and it's clearly white, Christian, um, male-dominated. Uh, but darker-skinned peoples, whether they're from Latin America, or whether they're from Africa, or whether they're from any other part of the world, uh, that don't fit that image uh, are clearly uh, not desired, certainly to come here, but as we see now also with, uh, I think with the family separations, the message is, again, you know, if you left, we wouldn't miss you. Uh, in fact, again, the United States would be greater uh, if that were to happen. Um, but also what you're now starting to see uh, on the border is the uh, questioning of people's citizenship. Okay? Uh, again, Hispanic Americans who, for example, are applying for passports are being denied um, and despite having documentation, despite having passports, I, I should say birth certificates um, that demonstrate that they were born in the United States, uh, that those are being questioned, the legitimacy of those are being questioned, therefore fundamentally their citizenship. Um, is being questioned, and it's just a very short step from there until their citizenship is revoked and they're denaturalized. Uh, and that is something that the government is currently already working on, uh, on a much larger scale, with a number, with tens of thousands of cases that are already uh, in the works. Um, and that is something that the Germans did uh, in the 1930s uh, to Jews, uh, starting with Jews who were naturalized, who became citizens. Um, in the 1920s and early 1930s after the First World War, uh, but then increasingly that net was, was cast wider. Uh, Jews who had been citizens their whole life but who had emigrated uh, were now legally able to, or the government was now legally able to revoke their citizenship. Um, and that also, as you mentioned too, uh, didn't only apply to Jews. Uh, it was applied to others. The big example of this, you know, when people say, well, again, it's, it's just Jews, or in this case, it's just, it's just Hispanics, it's just Latin Americans, I don't have to worry, I'm not Hispanic, I'm not Latin American, um, that can change. You know, again, the definition of who belongs, I think, um, for the administration is quite expansive, and they start with certain groups that are already kind of on the margins. It's easier to do because people, more people don't see them like they do themselves. Um, but then they can expand that out, and you know who's an American that can be again broadly defined. When, for example, the German government in 1935 passed laws that revoked um, or changed the citizenship, citizenship status of Jews to no longer full citizens but um, state residents, um, the definition of a Jew was that anyone who had three or more Jewish grandparents would be considered Jewish. Uh, and suddenly, thousands of Germans who had lived their entire lives thinking that they were Christian, their parents were Christian, uh, suddenly find out that their grandparents were not. Um, and they were now in the same situation as Jews, lost those citizenship rights. And eventually, if they had not been able to leave before 1941, uh, would also be deported to the East to be killed, along with Jews who, prior to that, they had never thought of in those terms, certainly never thought of themselves in those terms. Um, so, you know, it's something that's important to be aware of um, as early as possible, um, even if, again, it doesn't affect you directly. Um, a government that can do the kinds of things that it's doing right now to Hispanics, whether they're citizens or not, can do the same thing, you know, um, any other group, again, once, especially when they see that there's, there's acceptance of it, right? If there isn't really any kind of resistance, if they don't pay a price for it. Um, so I think that sense of excluding, of removing certain groups from the national community, uh, I think this is, you know, a real extreme example of sending that message of, of what they are, are trying to do and what they would like to do. Good. You know, Dr. Frankel and um, Dr. Zina both brought up something interesting, and it's that it's not that this is just a side effect of detaining people for, you know, of, of, of retention for the parents, right? Not that this is a side effect. This is actually targeting families, right? Part of the point is, well, this will deter more people 
immigrant into this country. Uh, so as a historian, specialist on migration, I'm curious, uh, Dr. Franklin, is there, is this, is there any historical precedent to this? Is this, been, is this unique? Is this? Yeah. So I think um, from my perspective, there are kind of two points that I want to make here. Um, and one of them is like, why focus on the family? Like, mm -hmm. What in administration's logic is the point of focusing on a family when you're thinking about migration, just generally? And then second, what does that mean for a democracy where there might be dissenting citizens? Um, so first, you know, we have to take this like idea of the family and think about it a little bit critically. Like, what does it mean to focus on a family? Clearly, it targets and is meant to provoke outrage um, from citizens who certainly feel for families and can feel for children because we're human, um, at least in my view. Um, but there's also another goal here because the family fulfills a very specific role in terms of the migrating family. So traditionally when we think about migrants, we often think about workers. We think about people moving for work who maybe have a temporary stay, who are coming to fulfill a role which is, which is prescribed, might be short term, and then return home. And that is seen as mutually beneficial, beneficial for the country that sends the migrant, who can then send money home to his family, uh, who has a job, um, who feels good about the, the fact that he can provide for his family. And then it also is good for the host country, who has a role that they need filled, and uh, someone will come and do it. Right. So in those terms, a migrant is a man. Uh, we already think about a migrant as a male worker. We don't think about a migrant as a woman worker. And that is just the way that we have been kind of historically conditioned to think about work. But when you have a family who is coming, you all of a sudden think about migration differently. And this is the point. When you think about a family who's coming, you think about permanence. You don't think about this as a temporary move. You think about children going to schools. You think about taxes being paid. You think about, oh, who's paying for that child's tuition at my public school? You think about, oh, is that mother, that wife or mother, is she going to do her role to help to uh, integrate that family into the host society? Who will do the, uh, the integrating into the host family if this is a, a kind of closed cultural loop of the mother, the father, the children? Who's going to help them to become a part of this new culture? So when you think about families migrating, all of a sudden there's this cultural impetus uh, that is structural, it comes from the outside as well as from the inside of the family, about how you're going to belong in the new society. And the claim here, which is separate from any really historical context, but the claim here in the US is that these families were not integrating. They don't belong. They haven't done the work of becoming American citizens. They haven't fulfilled this cultural melting pot. Uh, and therefore, they can't be a part of us. That's the logic, and it's a logic that is very similar across time and space in modern democracies. So that's my second point. This is, it's, not unusual, it's not unusual for a democracy to want to select its, its migrants. It's not in any way an aberration from the norm to, for a democracy to want to say, you are a good migrant, you are a bad migrant. And it's also not historically unusual for democracy to say families are not necessarily good migrants. There are cases of good migrant families, but only as a reaction to the supposed bad migrant families. So if that's the case, and if democracies can foster this, this kind of fundamentally illiberal uh, migration policy, then I think that uh, where his history can help us is by considering what can be your own role, knowing the history of family migration and exclusion, the ways that families have been historically targeted for migration uh, or um, prevented from migrating, what can be your role in helping to help create space in a democracy for migrants who ultimately have the same right to live here as any of us, many of whom are products of migration. Uh, so in that case, uh, I think of the words of a very famous uh, French uh, torture victim during the Algerian War for Independence. And he was a regular Frenchman who went to Algeria during a very large war uh, in which Algeria was fighting for its independence from France. And he was um, taken by the police. Uh, he was suspected of helping, uh, of trying to help the Algerians claim their independence. And uh, this was all under a democratic government. So he was taken and he was tortured for, in, for information about how he might have been helping the Algerians. And upon his release, because he was released, 
he wrote a book. And he did so, he said, in order to make French citizens think about what was happening in their name, in the name of democracy. So I want to draw a parallel here, too, just like Dr. Frankel, and say the administration today is saying that they are doing this for the good of America. They are separating families fundamentally for the preservation of an American society. They are doing this in order to protect and secure our borders. So I'm asking you all to think, is this what I want done in my name? And if not, go vote. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, so Anna Maria, um, it's it's interesting because on, on the one hand, this zero um, tolerance policy was that that started from the Trump administration. But even President Trump will say, "Look, this is the Democrats, and it's a shame, right? It's a shame that this happens." I'm not trying to make it more more partisan than it has to be, but I guess the point is that it's you know we have. An, an administration who, who started this policy, the, the left doesn't like it. And allegedly, the president says he doesn't like it as well, right? So hopefully this is more of a universal issue. So if people in general don't like this, as an immigration attorney, I guess my question for you is, is it legal? Is there anything we can do about it? Is there, is there precedent here? Sure. So, I mean, to kind of understand where we are today, you have to look back a number of years because, of course, the legal system is very much delayed and things that happened in the 90s are being you know, put into effect in law in, in subsequent years. So um, one case that gets thrown around a lot when trying to understand why are families being separated, why are children bring, being separated from their parents, is um, a case that uh, was, it went to the Supreme Court in the 90s. That was Flores v. Uh, Reno. And the issue there stemmed from children and teens coming to the U.S. in the 1980s. So a um, class action suit was filed in the name of uh, a 15-year-old girl, Jenny Flores, who was coming to the U.S. from El Salvador. She was 15 years old. She was detained. Um, at that time, this was before US citizen, uh, USCIS, which is um, United States Citizen and Immigration Services. Um, back then, it was INS, the um, Immigration and Naturalization. So she was coming to the U.S. to be with her aunt. She was handcuffed, she was strip searched, and they refused to um, deliver her to her aunt, saying that she could not be released to a third party adult, someone who was not her parents. Um, so part of this ongoing litigation, finally the government came to a settlement where they said, we're going to make certain requirements for children who are entering the United States. And so it imposed in through the settlement certain things that have to be complied with when children are coming to the U.S. Um, part of the Flores settlement says that children coming to the U.S. Um, are to be released from detention without unnecessary, to, uh, unnecessary delay to parents or other adult relatives or licensed programs. So often you'll hear about the unaccompanied minors who are coming to the U.S. and before they are released to family members here in the United States, they might go to a foster program or a temporary program while they're um, you know, waiting for someone to come, to come meet them. Um, and part of the requirements for these government uh, facilities where these children are detained is that there are certain accommodations that must be made for quality of life, for food, access to water, access to medical care, uh, assistance in medical emergencies, access to toilets, access to sinks, temperature controls, um, supervision, and then also um, separation from unrelated adults as much as possible. So when you see these images of these children at these facilities at the borders where we've all seen the, the, the images of children in cages, we've seen the overhead from aerials of um, women and children in outside in, in tents in these facilities, you can kind of ask yourself, does this comply with what your idea of um, a comfortable accommodation when you're coming to the United States is? Um, so. Those are the requirements that the government agreed to. Um, so to say whether or not it's legal what's happening, it's pretty much clear in writing what it is the government said it would do for children and, and families that were coming to the United States. And then as recently as 2015, there's um, another court ruling that said that these requirements not only apply to children who are coming to the United States unaccompanied, but it also applies to children who are arriving with parents. So just because um, you know, there's, there's a parent involved doesn't mean that these requirements for access to simple things such as toilets and water should be um, taken away from individuals. 
And um, as far as you know, what happens when someone comes to the United States? And often um, you have people coming through the border and they're seeking asylum and they're taken into detention. And one thing that I, I think is important to, to think about is that um, they are taken into detention. And that, that's one thing that I think often people might not realize, that these facilities where people are, um, you know, these migrants are, are housed are former jails. That, that is what they are. Um, we have a number of them here in Louisiana. So there are certain um, requirements that are imposed upon these facilities, but what type of access these individuals have to um, seek legal counsel, um, to interact and, and, and contact their family members here in the United States can be very limited. Um, also, you know, you think about the United States, you're, uh, when you're charged with a crime, you have the right to speak to an attorney and to be defended by an attorney in the criminal process. When you're coming to the United States and you come into the United States undocumented, that is a crime. I guess you know you, you can say that because you're coming without um, authorized entry to the United States with a visa. You are not entitled to an attorney in the immigration process. Um, <clears throat> so often individuals who are coming to the United States just don't know what their rights are, don't think that they have any rights. Um, so as far as you know, it's legal or not, I guess I'll circle back to my original statement is that the law is written in the, in the case um, and it is something that was determined and, and agreed to by, by the United States government and how it's being applied is as yet to be determined now by the um, current administration. Yeah, I, I know a, a, a federal judge in June uh, said that the children need to be re returned to the parents within 30 days and if right. they're under five within 14 days. Right. It does not seem like the government's complied. Is there, <laughs> I guess it just doesn't matter though, right? Uh, I mean, it's Constitution Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and uh, one thing that is, um, I guess, challenging with immigration law and not necessarily, uh, you know, of course we've heard that there's uh, uh, backlogs with records and, 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 you know, that whole system that has to get cleared there. But with just immigration in general, there are these constant delays and um, an incredible backlog of processing and paperwork that um, creates such a um, dilatory process for people to be able to access what rights they might even be eligible for. You know, uh, one thing that we often hear in the media and you know elsewhere is, well, why can't these people just follow the law and apply for a visa? Why can't they just come to the United States legally? And what I think um, many of us don't realize is that a lot of people have tried to come to the United States legally and just cannot, uh, they're, 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 it's just not their turn. Um, you know, to give you an idea of what the backlog is for some of these countries, for a, let's see, I, I wrote this down. <laughs> so when you're applying to the United States, you have to have a way to get to the U.S. So for many people, that would be through a permanent resident family member or a U.S. citizen family member. So for someone who has applied for a visa to the United States being sponsored by their parents, if you are from Mexico you're an un, and you're, you are an unmarried son or daughter of a U.S. citizen, um, they're currently processing visas with priority dates of November 1st, 1996. If you are a married son or daughter of a U.S. citizen applying to the United States for a visa and you are from Mexico, they are currently processing visas from October 1st, 1995. So that just kind of gives you an idea of what the backlog is. So when someone says, well, they should have just applied, think about what has happened in the last 20, what, 28 years. You know, that's an entire lifetime for so many people. And the urgency for um, these individuals to come to the United States it's not just on a whim, you know, this is, they're uprooting their entire life. And it's just that the political, economic um, situations in, in so many of these countries in, in Central, South America are so dire that they have no other choice but to try to come to the United States and seek whatever they can while they're here. Um, so, you know, to kind of answer your question about the time delays, I think this is just something that's Systematic. It's 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 throughout every single part of the immigration process in the U.S. I'm sure 
some people have questions, feel free if you have questions either to individual panel members or to the panel at large. Um, yes. Um, I'm sorry, but, uh, what were the specific legal justifications for the Trump policy to separate families? I mean, or can they just arbitrarily decide that this is going to be the policy that we implement? Well, part of the um, part of the uh, you know the policy is stemming back actually through you know several administrations. This, this is going back, I think, to 1997. Is that the idea was if a child was entering the United States and um, was entering the United States with someone who had been convicted of a crime, they could be separated from that adult. So when you think about someone coming to the United States entering as they say, without an inspection, without a visa, that person is committing a crime. So now saying, well, this person crossed the border without any documents, they are now a criminal, we can take this child away from them. Also, another um, argument was that it was to deter instances of child trafficking. And so wanting to vet the adults that children were entering the United States with so that ensuring that these children were not, being, were not victims of, of human trafficking. Um, and so finding like that tiny little loophole in, 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 a, in a law and trying to apply it you know, broad, broad base saying, well, everybody's coming to the United States is a criminal because they don't have documents. And that is going to be justification for separating children and parents. So there's a legal team on the Trump administration that's looking for these specific loopholes and then advising the application of state legal policy? Well, well, sure. You know, so that you, you've got the Department of Homeland Security, you've got the Office of Refugee Resettlement, you've got all these individual groups within the United States government who can look at the law and say, what can we do to legally, you know, make things work in our favor? Um, so, I mean, as far as like the specifics, what they might have looked at, I can't speak to, but I would, you know, these are things that um, exist within the law and can certainly be argued one way to, to try to justify what's going on. Is that information that the public can access? <laughs> Legal justification for this. Sorry. Um, I mean, a lot of it is there on the internet. I would, I would certainly like encourage you. I know, I know that the case law can be boring, but um, you know, jumping off like say with Flores v. Reno, you'll come up with the entire Supreme Court decision, and then searching from there to see what it is that others have been writing about and seeing how it is it's being justified. Um, there are a ton of cases right now going through the uh, the, the court systems. Everything. Um, you know, B. Jefferson, B. Sessions can can be pulled up. All of the legal documents are public records and can be pulled. Yeah, it's my understanding that, that it, it's not that this never took place. It's that it took place with great discretion. Right. And that now it used to be if someone was already a felon and had some, had some other problem, well, then this sort of thing could happen. And then now it's just every family that comes this is just what happens right? right and so also what you have to think about is like you're saying it happens with a lot of discretion it's happened in the past and then um, the immigration court system is very different from the federal court system or the state court system it is a separate administrative process um, judges are appointed to uh, I believe it's uh, tenure um, terms and um, it's, it's up to them to decide how to apply the law. Um, so you'll, it'll vary from state to state. You go to California and people were being, uh, women and children were being released with ankle monitoring bracelets and just saying, okay, check in at such and such date at this, at this location and no problem, go about your business. You'll come to Louisiana and nobody was being released um, from, from detention. And now we have these instances where there's just such a surge at the border that um, you would think that maybe releasing people to their families to you know assimilate into homes and, and communities would take some strain off of the detention centers. But again, it's it's at the great discretion of the judges. Yeah. yeah. Um, could a family member of okay, so like let's say an aunt lives here, can they bring a case on behalf of the immigrant? I know you have. To to have standing everything, but wouldn't they have the standing to represent their family members who don't have the rights? Are you saying like to sponsor a visa or to get someone to the United yeah, States? Yeah, even just to appeal to the Supreme Court file a suit against the 
Of someone who's already in detention. Of, of someone who's already in detention. I think she's asking hearing, if a family. We're detaining, mm -hmm. and like the um, government breaking the law by whatever they do, can a family member who has citizenship here bring a case on behalf of the wrongdoing against a legal family member? Well, I think it would all, you know, often with those types of scenarios, it would happen, you'd have to kind of look and see what happened to the individual when they were detained and then also what the um, circumstances were in the relationship with that family member. Um, it's often it's the individual who have to bring the suit, uh, not a family member on their behalf. And what, what characteristics would be bad enough? Like, what would the government have to do to actually, like, make a case, I guess? Like, because, okay, so... Obviously, by them putting them in cages, it's legal if they can still do it. So what would, what would they have to do to make it not legal? To well, make it not a federal crime, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, I mean, like, as the case law says, you have to have access to certain things. So it would be up to, uh, you know, whoever might be suing the government to show that, you know, the conditions did not meet what, what the standard okay, was. Like the toilets and sinks and stuff. Right. Okay. I think it's, yeah, yeah. The other thing I would say, too, is, I mean, there's a question of what's legal and what's illegal here. Um, there's the question of, like, how the Trump administration has been manipulating the law in order to find loopholes to find legality where it might seem unappealing. And then there's the altogether separate issue of the court of public opinion, which I think is the one that held court in June this year. And I think that it's important to remember that, like, the letter of the law can sometimes, it can fall both ways. Um, even if it seems very unjust to like lay person, uh, to a lay person. So when people call their senators, that has an effect as well. And even the Trump, so even in the end, Trump is saying he doesn't like the policies that he explicitly helped to design, to co-sign, right? So by the end of June, people who had refused to come out in the first six weeks of child separation were saying that this was a reprehensible policy. Republicans signed the, whatever they call it, the Hatch Act, or um, in order to try to prevent this thing that they helped to create. Uh, so I think too, like the question of legal, illegal is important here, but given that they have very smart people working on finding loopholes, like we too have to remember that we can mobilize our own political capital, um, even when it feels like we don't have any, um, because well, you call enough people call Cassidy's office, can, uh, Kennedy's office. Sure. So they're going to have to sure. eventually answer. Yeah, it's it's an interesting, really interesting question. Though. I mean, to think that if, if let's say some an aunt has a, a three year old that crosses a border, you say, well, the three year old can't is affected, but she can't file suit. But she can't file suit. Seems a bit crazy, right? It seems like at that point, three year olds. So yeah, I would just assume that most of these detainees. Uh, a majority of the detainees, but some of them just aren't like legal. You know, some of them may be legal, you know, not morally but legal, but some of them may not be legal. And I just would assume that a lot of these detainees do not have the funds, you know, to hire an attorney, otherwise they, you know, would have found a route to come to America. So how do you as a, you as a uh, immigration attorney and other immigration attorneys, how do you uh, <clears throat> help these detainees who do not have the funds to go forth with a suit, or it's mostly your work pro bono, or, you know. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of attorneys, uh, myself and my firm included, that, that, that do work um, pro bono for, for certain cases. Also, um, there are uh, certain requirements, and the name of the laws is escaping right, right now, but they do, at these detain, uh, detention facilities, have to make give access rather to a list of, of attorneys who would be willing to to represent clients or individuals um, you know at low cost or no cost um, there are programs that go into the facilities and interview uh, detainees find out what their circumstances are and see who might be available to help them um, you know here in Louisiana our detention facilities are in um, Bazile LaSalle uh, or Bazile rather Oakdale um, Pine Prairie you know, so they're, they're in these areas of the state where there aren't a lot of attorneys mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, so it is very difficult. But um, 
you know, there are programs that go into into the facilities and, and, and try to uh, tell people what their rights are, that they are here. Um, you know, another, another thing to keep in mind, which can be frustrating, is that if you are in, in detention, if you are, um, unless there is a, um, a form of, of relief, you know, if you're eligible for some relief, um, your you are most likely to be removed from the country. You know, the judge is not going to just let someone out um, on an immigration bond unless there is some um, argument that's made that this person has a right to be in this country and has an avenue to, to gain um, lawful residence here or, or, or lawful presence in, in the country. So there is um, a lot of backlog there as well. Just because you come into the United States, you're not immediately removed from the country. There are proceedings that, that are had. Um, if you're coming into the United States and you're seeking asylum, you go through what's called a credible fear interview, and you meet with someone and they talk about why you're in the United States and what it is um, you've experienced in your country, and if you have what they call you know, a strong possibility that you're going to be able to present a case, uh, that you have a credible fear of returning to your home country. Um, so while there are uh, you know, it's not the same rights that you have in the criminal system here in the U.S. There are, uh, there are rights that you have while you are detained, and so there are programs that are trying to make sure the people who are here, at least in Louisiana, are aware of what, what they can do and what avenues they can pursue. Yeah. I have a question I'd like to hear maybe Rich talk about this, and that is that there were a bunch of Jews that were trying to gain access to the United States during the Second World War, and I'm curious, and they too were saying, oh, well, we're going to be killed, right? if we go back to Europe. So, I mean, are there, what are the parallels between these cases of people coming up from Central America where uh, they're facing crazy violence down there and members of their family have been killed and the cases, uh, you know, <coughs> 70 years ago when mm -hmm. Jews were trying to gain entrance with very much the same kind of story? Yeah, that's a, you know, there is certainly, um, uh, there are certainly parallels there. Um, in the 1930s, um, as more and more Jews in Germany came to the decision, which was not an easy one by any means, um, that they should leave, um, the biggest obstacle for them, aside from the German government, um, was where to go. Uh, most countries were um, not particularly interested in taking Jews uh, and the United States was certainly one of those. In 1924, the uh, immigration restriction law that was passed um, then basically shut the door um, to I mean, a very small trickle of, of Jews from Eastern Europe uh, or Jews in general who were allowed into the United States. Um, that law was still on the books in the 1930s when now you had, you know, again, a clear uh, need for Jews to find safe haven and uh, American politicians were in no mood to, or had no desire really to um, expand those um, uh, limits that were already in place. In fact, uh, throughout the 1930s, um, those limits were not even being reached in terms of ones that were actually being granted visas to come to the United States. So there was still already, even before the, you, you had to make a decision whether you wanted to increase the caps, um, you could still have taken more people in. Um, the United States at that time uh, was experiencing a level of anti-Semitism that had, it had never experienced before. Uh, in that sense, very similar to the rest of Europe. Um, if Roosevelt had um, done more, and that's debatable what he could have done, uh, it would have been tremendously unpopular. Um, the, uh, the party would have suffered in terms of elections. Um, the, uh, the case that's most famous is the St. Louis. Um, this was a ship that took about 900 uh, German Jews from Germany um, initially to go to Cuba to uh, find refuge. Uh, the Cuban government said no. Uh, the ship went up and down the uh, east coast of the United States without ever being allowed to dock um, and was eventually forced to return to Europe. They were taken in uh, in part by Britain, Belgium, um, and France. Um, many of them would, would 
uh, die in the Holocaust. The Holocaust hadn't occurred yet. It's important to remember, too. The Second World War hadn't begun yet, so it's not like they were being sent to their deaths, but they certainly were being sent to a, uh, a fate that was far, you know, far worse. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and also I just, just to uh, make another parallel in terms of the situation now would be the kinds of uh, reasons that were given, the rhetoric that was used to justify excluding Jews uh, who were clearly in need of, of safe haven. Um, they were unassimilable, right? They didn't speak English. Uh, they were foreign in terms of their culture and religion. They would take jobs from Americans. Uh, they were criminals. They were politically suspect. Either they were communists, which was a very common uh, label to uh, assume or associate with Jews, uh, or, and this also you would hear too in the United States with regard to immigrants, uh, Arab immigrants, for example, from, from the Middle East, um, that they were in fact Nazis who were coming to the United States under the guise of being Jewish, but really to come to sabotage. You know, so the idea that Arab immigrants who are coming are terrorists, a uh, very similar kind of, of notion. That, so all, all of the, any, any basic, basically any excuse that you hear now uh, for excluding either Hispanic immigrants or um, Middle Eastern immigrants have all been used um, for Jews uh, in the 1930s and before. So um, it's, it's really depressing to, to see that come again. You know, it's, you, you like as an historian to study history and not, uh, you, you want it to be relevant, but then it's sometimes it's uncomfortably relevant. You know, there's, there should be a, some, some kind of buffer between, between the two, but it's, it really is staggering uh, to see the, the similarities. But some, I'm sure, were fine. Yeah, of course, some, you know, everyone knows one that they like. Uh, so. uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, and then uh, I guess there's, I mean, well, I can answer this, but... I guess the Trump administration pushed this policy into fruition, and uh, you know Trump kind of tried to backpedal with it. So, as you know, the future comes. How do you feel? How do y'all feel? Um, you know, what, what do y'all feel will happen in regards to the immigration policy? And now that Trump tries to backpedal, and you know we have the Republican controls the majority of Congress, so. What do you, how do y'all see this playing out? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, yeah. I just want to say a couple things that are made, made more, not exactly on that point, but a couple things. One is, um, one of the things that seems to be happening is there's so much stuff happening every single day, we get distracted. You know, and as somebody commented, as you commented earlier, you know, one of the reasons why things set, sh shut down as they did back in June was because of the public outcry. And as long as we have, you know, as long as we have our immigrants in, you know, in these weird places I and mean, they're at, and they're invisible to us, it goes away, and we forget about it really, really fast. And so that, to that extent, I think that's a big concern because if it's not on, in, right in front of us, you know, we're we're off onto something else. Um, the other thing that I think, so we have a false sense of everything's all right. The other thing, and talking about the legal requirements of these detention facilities, as you were talking about it, it sounded to me a little bit like those orphanages in England mm -hmm. where kids were clean and dry and mm -hmm. more or less physically and taken care the of, through. but there were, all, there were all these, but there were pieces of their care that wasn't really okay. And of course the physical care in some ways is a lot easier to show and do than the emotional care. And I think this is, obviously it's a very emotional, this whole thing is emotional, you know, it's not easy, but I worry that we, that we, it comes off the radar screen, we forget about it, it's not right in our face. And so this kind of insidious, you know, arguments that people are making and this fear that's being, you know, that's being put about, you know, and, and falsehoods about who these people are, are, you know, creep in and become part of what we just kind of accept. And to me, that's a very dangerous place to be. Mm -hmm. you know? I think, uh, well, there's a couple of points also about that. Um, one of which is, of course, as, as Dr. Franklin said, you need to push back. Mm -hmm. um, part of, you know, when it's this early 
they are, in a sense, testing. You know, you, you try things and see what the response is. If there is one, you can pull back for the time being. You move forward later at a more favorable moment. I mean, even, even the Nazis did that. Again, obviously, we're, we're a democracy still. Um, Nazis were, of course, a dictatorship. Um, but even they were aware of the need for public support. And so they did react in certain cases, not as much with regard to Jews. Um, there was very little in terms of protest. But in certain other cases that did affect the wider public, um, they did respond. I think a big problem also, uh, and this is related to uh, strategies that the, that the Germans used back then, is uh, uh, Trump's undermining of just a basic notion of truth uh, and doubt in terms of the news, that once that takes hold and there is a certain level of doubt, of course, they deny, right? They can deny that these things are happening or that they're as bad as people say. And there's a natural desire not to believe that your government puts children in cages, right? That they do horrible things like this. Um, and so that doubt that he, he strategically uses um, allows people to um, sort of not act, right? Because well, I don't know exactly, I'm not 100%. The government says it's not happening. Do we really know? And so forth. Um, and the Germans, you know, they did that too. They talked about, you know, fake news coming from, from abroad. Uh, and they used very deceptive language, you know, euphemisms and so forth to talk about deportations, to talk about Jews being sent to work camps in the East. And again, if you're a German, um, you're not Jewish, um, you you could know most of what was happening, but if you didn't want to know, you could avoid it by not asking certain questions or by accepting to a certain degree what the government's saying. So that's an important part. That's why, that's why it's done, so people don't. They, they're frozen in a sense. They're not sure if they should act. Sure. Yeah, as, on the one hand, we can find pictures of children in cages. On the other hand, uh, they're very happy to show oh, look, these, these kids have video games. They'll take the one case. Of course, to Dr. Zena's point, it's irrelevant anyway. But if you want to, 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 to believe that mm -hmm. there's nothing bad happening there, it's, you, you can find some evidence mm -hmm. to believe that for sure. Uh, Professor Patton. Yeah, so great. My question's a good follow-up to this. Besides the obvious, um, getting involved in the short vote in the midterm and then obviously the next presidential election, uh, and telephone you know, politicians to change policy, are there any organizations uh, within the state of Louisiana, non-governmental organizations, nonprofit organizations, where average citizens can join or volunteer that are addressing these issues specifically? Um, <clears throat> as far as like immigration and, and, and immigration law goes, there you know um, there is a group of um, a group of immigration attorneys in New Orleans and Baton Rouge that uh, get together uh, once a month and they do travel to these um, facilities. Um, as far as what they need for like uh, getting involved in, 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 in representation, they uh, often need translators. So people who have the ability to just get into the facilities with them and offer translation because there aren't that many, um, there are a lot of immigration attorneys, not everybody speaks another language. So, um, you know, individuals who can, and it's even, you know, you don't have to be the most advanced speaker, just a basic understanding to be able to ask someone, when did you come here? How long have you been here? Why are you here? And you, know, you don't even have to know all the words, just being able to sit with someone and, and, and work with them that way. Um, I think that is one of the greatest needs, is having someone who's able to um, cross that language barrier a lot of attorneys in Louisiana, but not, uh, you know, not everybody can have those skills of the, of the language and the law. And will they allow um, these individuals to travel with this group of attorneys to be to um, translators? In the yes, yes. I mean, if you're interested, I can kind of give you the information of some of the attorneys that I know that um, put you in touch with them to see what, uh, what needs that they might have, because um, I know that translation is probably the biggest challenge. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Nice, great question. Oh, we had a hint over here that we missed. Oh, yeah. the Thank you, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, for the child development 
uh, yellow, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you specific, but earlier you mentioned that the uh, people in like the facilities where they, you know, had the child separation thing happen, um, you said that they weren't allowed to touch the shelter. I thought that was interesting. Uh, with my limited knowledge, I know that like touch is really important for like child development. And do you think it would be better or worse to have a policy where you're not allowed to touch the children or whether you are? Because I could see how both would be problematic. I don't know exactly what their rationale is for this other than oftentimes you'll see like in children who are in foster care and those kinds of things, foster parents and even foster care workers will say, don't get too close to them because you don't want to, you know. But there's good science that says that's exactly what they need. And that, you know, in a, in a, in a chant, in the time of extraordinary distress that these children are experiencing, having somebody who knows who they are, who looks to their, you know, tries to comfort them, who can provide some solace, is physiologically going to be helpful to them as well as psychologically. So I would feel very strongly that that's poor guidance. I mean, it's sort of in the lore, you know, you don't want to get too close to kids or whatever, but, but that really, that science doesn't support that approach. And even if they get moved, I mean, we, there's a whole bunch of things to talk about. You know, they get moved around and they're, they're never in one place for very long and all that sort of stuff. Or they have repeated caregivers and that sort of thing. If they can still have, you know, somebody in that, behind those fences, you know, who says, okay, Paula, I know who you are. You're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come sit down and read a story to you today or I'm going to do this out of the other. And, you, you know, I notice who you are and I'm going to comfort you when you're, that's going to be helpful to that child. It may not buffer everything, but it will provide a, a buffer for that child. Yeah. So a lot of the questions have been about what you, you know, nationally what's legal and what can be done. You know, some people have raised the argument that it's violates some international laws, mm -hmm. right? Some human rights yeah. violations. I know the UN has reviewed it right. recently. Right. Uh, is is, it, is there uh, any recourse in that respect? As far as, you know, like here in the United States, you know, um, you know, I, I, I'm really not sure yeah. what, what the recourse is, um, you know, outside of the U.S. or, or you know, other governments getting involved. We've seen, you know, when, when the United States, well, other countries have <coughs> policies in the United States and U.S. backing out of trade policies, mm -hmm. backing right. out of um, other agreements and the repercussions that have happened here. I don't know what would have to happen for international pressure to right. change what's going on in the U.S. But I, you know, it seems to me like if we saw this happening someplace else, we would be outraged, mm -hmm. right? We, I mean, I don't know, but it just seems like if we saw this happening, you know, in, in with the other countries that are seeing a big massive wave of immigrants coming in and they're separating children and all that, we would have outrage. The science is there. So we're not paying attention to what we know, and it's kind of like what you were saying, we're not paying attention to what we know happened from history not that long ago, just in the 30s, you know, the handwriting is on the wall right in front of us, the handwriting's on the wall right in front of us about what's going on with these kids, and yet we're not paying attention to it, right, I mean, you which is, either, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I just, I wanted to just play devil's advocate here and say, or just remind that like this has happened before. We've seen this before, undoubtedly. Um, and we saw it in the case of the Nazis, definitely. And it is important to remember that. But it's also important for us to not wait, and I think you would agree with this, not wait for something to feel like or approach the scale of Nazi violence or destruction in order to feel deeply unsettled by what's happening in our country. Uh, just because we have a democracy uh, in most states, um, <laughs> doesn't mean that we can't also violate international law, that we can't also violate human rights, that we can't also violate the citizenship rights of people who ha were born here. So it's important, I think, to, to remember that all of this is precarious, and the things that we take for granted, um, especially those of us who were born here, uh, or whose parents were also born here, it's not, it doesn't go without saying. Uh, and that's what you get when you <laughs> when you invite historians to your panel. Right, yeah. <laughs> no, but you know, Judge Hannah, um, who did the immigration series, 
ceremony, the, I mean, the naturalization ceremony this morning mentioned that. He said, you know, okay, it's Constitution Day. We have to remember one of the words that's not included in the Constitution mm -hmm. is the word democracy, mm -hmm. because we're a republic. So if you want, if it's a, he, he brought up the point that this government is by the people, for the people, that's how the Constitution begins and ends. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then the power that, the, we have to remember also, as, as Dr. Franklin is saying, we have to remember that the power is in our hands. If you, you know, go and vote and, and be part of that process, um, in this great republic to change, to make things change. Yeah, one in five uh, people under the age of 24 vote. You guys, you guys can all vote. Uh, the lines may be long, they may be inconvenient, but that is by design. Like, voting is not easy on purpose to discourage voter turnout because you guys, like, we can, Louisiana can and might go in any other any any number of ways. Just to add to it, now is when it's much easier to prevent things. Yes, you know, yes. <laughs> when the Nazis are in control yeah. and they've got all of the levers of power and, and public sphere and, and so the forth. Court. And the courts and the police, then it's 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 very it's extraordinarily then it really does require you to risk your life. Uh, and some will do that, but not many not everyone can be expected to do that. You can't wait, you know. Um, that's, that's part of the problem with the Nazis is, you know, we know that, we've seen what they did, we built camps and so forth. But you can't wait until that, till you see Auschwitz being built or camps be. It's too late, you know. It's before they come to power and it's while the window is still open, um, that's when it has to be done. And so you have to always prevent it from getting to that point, and that's a strange thing, of course. You, mm. you don't know if you've actually prevented anything because it hasn't come. But believe me, now is, now is you know, historically speaking, when it should have been done in Germany, you know, that's when you have to do it. Uh, in the back of the first, and, uh, I was wondering, would y'all happen to know like, what is the mixing in Germany to help them take their sentences from these conditions? Mm. I didn't hear the question. What the, what the government of Mexico is doing if there is oh. anything to From the U.S.? Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure a lot of them are actually Mexican citizens. Yeah. I think there are more of them from Central America. But it is interesting to think, I mean, when Dr. Zina mentioned another country, I had in mind, well, what if another country then is to U.S. citizens? Mm -hmm. How would we feel about that <laughs> yeah. then? Probably not. not to mention Fantastic, that. right? Speak up uh, a little bit, please. Oh, sure. Yeah, um, talking about you, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we had a, a, a hand right here, and then. Um, mine's for Dr. Richard. When you were talking about the Germans and like the correlation between now and then, you, you mentioned something about um, people getting their citizenship revoked, like being natural born. Was that then, or is that happening now? Oh, that was then. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah, that was happening. Yes. But it is but it's starting to happen now. Oh, you mean here in the United States? Yes. Yeah. Oh, it happened in Germany then, and it's happening in the United States now, yes. Could you go into more depth than that? Well, I mean, the most recent example of this was the, these cases that have been taking place along the border uh, with Mexico. Um, Hispanic Americans who are citizens, who have birth certificates, um, uh, have been denied passports. They've been applying for passports, and they're denied that based on suspicion about the genuine, you know, uh, nature of their passport, right? And implication being that they're, they're fake and they're therefore not really citizens. Um, and then they can revoke it. But there's also a more general um, process that's being undertaken, I believe, in state or whatever um, agencies that deal with this to review all kinds of um, examples of people who may have either lied or made mistakes on their visa applications and so forth, or applications for citizenship, and to use those as justifications for uh, withdrawing those um, uh, status, the status of those people, whether it's citizenship or it's visa applications, green cards, things like that. So there's clearly a desire to um, not just, no longer just prevent people from coming in, which of course is part of it, but is also now to begin to remove people uh, from the community. And it's happening in the arena of paperwork. Like all this looks dull and it yeah. takes a long time mm -hmm. and it's like very uneventful and that's what's most
disturbing about it is it can pass underneath the surface on underneath the surface because you know you feel like an isolated case like oh maybe I did make a mistake on my you know whatever but really this is systematic and that that process was originally um, used because uh, until and historically fairly recently it was extraordinarily difficult to take someone's citizenship away um, deliberately so that began to change for the specific purpose of um, uh, removing the citizenship of Nazis and Nazi collaborators who came to the United States after the Second World War and obviously lied about what they had been doing in order to gain access and to gain citizenship. Um, you, so it took Nazis basically coming in to open the door to that. It was, ne it was not intended for people who were honestly coming in and again may have fudged something here or there or obviously not lying about being Nazis but you know something like that so it's again there's a precedent for it but it's it's being misapplied in that sense for specific purposes I see your hand in the back and then Dr. Cross afterwards because okay. Okay. you might have the final word Dr. Cross <laughs> uh, <No. laughs> uh, for each of y'all uh, do y'all think it should be easier harder um, for the actual uh, citizenship process well, I mean, I guess it's kind of relative. I mean, it is a lengthy process. So when you come to the United States, if you're eligible for permanent residence, you have to have your permanent residence for five years. And then, and then after you complete that application, you have to apply again to become a citizen and go through that application process and review. And if anything's changed since you've gotten your, your residence to when you're ready to naturalize and apply for your citizenship, if you've had any minor run-ins with the law, any of those things could prevent you from, you know, having an approved application for, for citizenship. So, um, you know, I think the notion that just anybody can become a citizen, it's, um, you know, it's a false notion because there there is a vetting process there and every single application is reviewed. When you're going in to have your, before you even have an, an interview with an immigration officer, you go through a fingerprinting process. You have to go and you actually have to have a physical and they, they, you know, check your vaccinations and they say where you've come from. It's not just anybody coming to the U.S. can apply and be admitted. So there is a process there and it takes a long time. Um, and then, you know, people who are coming to this country often have um, a great loyalty and connection to their home country. And it's, re you know, releasing and, and, and deciding I'm going to become a U.S. citizen and I'm going to uh, let go of, you know, whatever citizenship I might have. They're not going to, you know, maintain dual citizenship or whatever it might be. It's, um, it's a very involved process. So um, I don't know how it could become more complex. I'm sure someone could have an idea, but as it is now, it's, it's not simple as it stands. Well, um, the question on being more complex, of course, if you do extensive background checks, um, make sure the, uh, the United Nations actually files paperwork for every uh, person. If you're going back and forth between nations trying to become a citizen, you can check paperwork. I know it's um, more complex, but like you said, uh, if it needs to become a longer thing, if it needs to become easier, uh, whatever it takes to get these people from not having to deal with um, a country that makes them feel like they need to leave is good enough for me. Um, I was wondering if anyone Leave their original country, you're saying? Yeah. yeah. I know the Obama administration put like a billion dollars into uh, Central and South America and I think with some success in terms of that. Uh, Dr. Cross. Well, I just want to say, you know, I'm enjoying this panel. This panel's great. And this is an issue of importance, this immigration issue. But you know, as historical roots right now. But I'd like to also point out that this is actually slightly less than what I consider to be half the conversation. The conversation is, or I think should also include, uh, attempts to suppress voters at the polls all across the United States and all the districts, uh, shutting down of polling places, radical redistricting, denying people's rights at the polls, changing voter registration laws to demand forms of ID that people don't have, denying people certificates, making it more difficult for people to cast votes, and then casting aspersions on the actual votes cast, as we saw with the President's Commission on 
voter integrity when in fact, which existed in the complete absence of any actual proof that the polls were in fact under danger. But all of this has a huge suppressive effort uh, and so to me, this is part and parcel of what we're talking about And justified here. by a fear of illegal immigration. Exactly, justified by the fear of the illegal immigration. And then the next thing you know, I mean, the number of people that are not voting in this country is an enormous scandal, an enormous scandal. The number of people who are frankly kept away from the polls, either because they have a felony on their record in the distant past, or because they are 60 miles from the nearest polling place, or because they don't have adequate forms of identification that only affluent people have. Uh, this is a huge issue, and so to me, this issue we're talking about today is really important, but the companion piece is this other effort that's going on that I see is somehow as even worse in terms of creating the Comment, not a <laughs> <laughs> I think we probably have time for two. Oh, um, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> three more questions. How about? <laughs> okay, we'll finish this because I know. Um, and I guess this kind of ties into his question. And for lack of better term, and be sure. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say, be sure to speak up. So uh, right. And for lack of uh, better term, immigration has always been a problem in America. So, what about uh, the president's uh, rhetoric in his earlier campaign, and, and what about? I guess the administration trying so hard to create this policy, the immigration policy, has caused this topic to be so highly highlighted now, even though it's always been, for lack of a better term, a problem. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of Dr. Dr. Frankel's point about Can kind you of students. The question? Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, somebody from the front. The, so we can hear it back the question was like, what? So, if immigration oh, no. is often framed as a problem in American society, as an issue or a question to be answered, then what are like the most proximate causes for why Trump was able to capitalize on this supposed problem? Um, I think you know, you'd have yeah, as many. Why is it an issue? Like, yeah. Why is it so highlighted now? As not two years into his presidency? Yeah. yeah. I feel like there's a, you get as many answers as panelists, but for me, like for me, the question is really fundamentally one of um, anxiety about cultural assimilation and the uh, degradation of what is seen as a mythic American past. So I think that Trump is quite honest in what he's doing. You know, make America great again is the goal, and great again would look like um, kind of a. Uh, television idea of what America was like in the 1950s. So not even the reality of the 50s, but rather a certain representation of the 50s. Um, very white, very scrubbed clean, very suburby, uh, two and a half kids, uh, criminals on the outside, outside of the picture, right? Yeah. So this is, so for me, it's, you know, there are economic anxieties. The economy is not good for everyday citizens uh, outside of Wall Street. And those things are compounding factors, but to me they're not uh, the only ones. For me, I see this as an issue of culture and cultural assimilation, and that's why I focus on this issue of families, because families are always presented as a problem of migration, even in periods of economic growth. So if that can be the case, then it seems like this cultural assimilation, this fear about making America great again is, is really kind of the crux issue. We're pushing it, but we have time for two questions. Click here first, and we'll finish with the. Uh, Franklin. 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 Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And then Dr. Uh, Cross. 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 Uh, Dr. Cross. Okay, so my question has to do with the voting polls. Well, kind of like a comment question. Um, so it has to do. You talked about um, people, the, the government's like limiting voting and trying to get like stop people or make it hard for people to vote. What what about voter fraud? Um, mm -hmm. I'm from Illinois and I live in St. Clair County, mm -hmm. and we have a very large problem with voter fraud, especially in East St. Louis. Mm -hmm. There have been um, there's essentially no voter fraud in this country. Essentially, very rare. essentially no voter fraud. Well, think about the cal calculus of it. Okay. You want to steal an election and you're going to do it one vote at a time. I'm going to break the law, I'm going to commit a felony, and I'm going to go cast my vote. That would be like one vote, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how many people are motivated to commit a felony that involves casting a vote that probably won't matter anyway in the big scheme of things? 
only one in five people vote anyway. Under 24. People are afraid that somehow vote elections are being stolen or something by masses of immigrants who vote. But have you tried to vote lately? You know, what yes. they get you to do when they vote? You know, put your ID, sign on the line, check your address, they do all that stuff. Well, frankly, that's a lot of hoops to jump through, and that happens everywhere. It's not just here, not when you vote. So the idea that somehow somebody's going to game that system mm -hmm. one at a time and create voter fraud, right. I mean, it's, it was extraordinarily rare. You know, uh, in fact, Chris Kobach in Kansas, when he, uh, when he was in his own Supreme Court in their reading of what he was doing in Kansas and just pursuing this voter fraud thing, said, we think that it is possible that if Chris Kobach spends the next 10 years searching for voter fraud, that he might actually find voter fraud that goes into the double digits. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. In other words, right. they had found nine cases, and they'd spent millions of dollars, and Chris Kobach got named head of the presidential commission. There, there isn't any voter fraud. And I think many of these cases were uh, spouses who had passed away, mm -hmm. people had voted there's some cases for, where people voted you know. in two precincts because they <laughs> moved and they didn't right. know or they tried to vote, but in most of those cases they cast provisional ballots yeah. anyway, right. which then are only only checked after the election and only if the election is close enough. Yeah. So. Well, so final comment from Yes, I also want to remind all the students here, I want to encourage everyone to vote. It is uh, your right, and you should do it. And I also want to remind all of you students who are, if you do not live here and you are registered to vote somewhere else, it is extremely easy to go to govote.com, change your, vo your voter registration temporarily for the time that you're going to be in Lafayette in our district, and vote now. Then, when you go home, you can do it. You can change it back. It is enormously easy. There is no limit to the number of times you can do this. Our election day coming up is on a Tuesday. It could likely be difficult for some people to travel to their home districts. And I encourage you all to have your voice as citizens, and not only your voice, but you go vote. Take ten people with you. That's all I have to say. Cool. All right, well, uh, thank you so much for coming and helping us celebrate our Constitution and Constitution Day. Applause for our panel, please. Thank you.